Good afternoon, everybody. A um, couple of thank yous to start off with, if I may. Uh, thank you for Incozy for giving me this opportunity and um, the organising committee of the conference for making such a great event. I've had a great week here, so it's uh, been a pleasure to attend the conference. Um, given it's Friday afternoon, there was a party last night. Uh, thanks to the audience, to all of you, for um, turning up. It's been, <laughs> it's been a great pleasure to see you here. Come and listen to me. Um, and what I'm going to do today is just run through uh, some of the research and work we've done um, in Australia, along with a number of other people, looking at the conceptual design phase of uh, the system life cycle and looking at those opportunities for model-based systems engineering in, in that early phase. <coughs> and specifically, this is sort of a bit of a, for me, it's a bit of a start of the journey of the next phase of that research. So I was going to sort of go through that. But um, like all presenters, I'll just give you a quick brief um, background to me. Um, I've certainly had an interest and a passion towards design and modelling over my career, and that's where I'm continuing to go. I've been involved in uh, the model-based conceptual design working group within COSI for a number of years since its initiation, and I was the chair when it got initiated. Um, and just over two years ago, we produced an insight special edition um, looking at model-based conceptual design, so if you want to go back and look at that, feel, feel free. Um, and also chaired the Model Based Systems Engineering Symposium in Australia for the last five years, is it? I think for those people in Australia. Um, and like our illustrious president over there, I am slightly Scottish. So, uh, although I'm not wearing a kilt. <laughs> um, and here's my family history, not quite as good as stabbing someone or whatever Alan's history was. <laughs> um, I'm actually related to Robert, the Burn, Robert Burns. Um, does anyone know what the anniversary is today for Robert Burns? Did anyone see the news this morning? I should know this as, as a, a relative, but apparently it's the uh, 220th anniversary of his death today, so it's quite apt that I'm related. Um, and the reason I'm putting that up there is two reasons I wanted to raise it. One, well, third maybe being slightly Scottish, but the main reason is that um, this is my family tree, and to me, I wanted to start talking about descriptive models or architectural models, and this is a good example. Obviously, this wouldn't be a model-based systems engineering presentation without um, an eye test, so I will be testing you on the uh, content of this model later. I could have made it the size of a wall if I wanted to, but I uh, just went for an abbreviated version there. But this is where I want to talk about these kind of um, descriptive models, and that's where I'm going to come from. Um, and also, through my own personal research into Robert Burns, um, I pulled out one of his quotes, which I think is really apt for our um, engineering world. There's no such uncertainty as a sure thing. In other words, we're going to make this system, but there's so much uncertainty through the process getting there. So, and I wanted to sort of address that quote through my, through my talk. So um, we'll get to that when we get to it, I guess. Um, before we go any further, I wanted to sort of get a bit of a level playing field, I guess, to, for understanding. And um, definitions are always dangerous. There's a plethora of spaces out there that you can go and look for a definition on what design is and what modeling is. There's the two of the ones that I just pick up in a way, and which is um, design an activity to create concepts to conceive something, and a model is an abstraction of something, and then bringing those two together. Um, and one of my unattributable quotes that I like to put out there that's um, to model is to understand, and to me that's what it's all about, that design and modeling phase. Um, so there, I just sort of put those out so we're all on the same page. Um, and we model for a number of, number of reasons. Um, I've just picked on two, and, and as we heard in, in this conference a number of times from a number of people, we've done modelling in all sorts of forms for a number of years in the engineering and systems engineering world, and I've picked on the, deliberately picked these two black and white photos to give an indication that it's been there for a number of years. And on the right there, we see these uh, models that are produced for wind tunnel tests, and thanks very much to the Aircraft Research Association down in Bedford for the supply of the images. And we've got the original sort of concepts there that are testing for Harrier, and in the background, the Concorde for wind tunnel testing. And then on my right, to keep that family sort of heritage go going, is a picture of my father. Oh, sorry, on the left is a picture of my father. Um, and he very much started in the modelling world, and he started actually working on the Harrier aircraft and he built models of that Harry Aircraft wind tunnel. But through his career, he moved into this sort of concept formulation. And this is one of the models he made on the left there, which is a, a Formula One. In the early days of the Formula One, when they started to get more professional about the, the motorsport, um, they wanted to sort of put everything into a one big trailer so they could cart it around Europe. And so this was one of the concepts the team came up with in terms of how they were going to get the mechanics, the analysts, 
the engineers all into one space and carry the vehicles. And so this was a concept formulation kind of model. So I guess there's a number of ways out there to model things. There's a number of reasons for modeling. But I really wanted to sort of take it back to that sort of front end of, of the concept definition as we know in the system's life cycle. And to start to, what we did in our research was we looked at that problem space, the stakeholder needs and the requirements. Um, and so what I like to think about that phase is the initial part of the design. And so to me, those artifacts that come out of that, that early phase in which results in stakeholders' needs and requirements is actually part, is an actual, they're actually design artifacts in, in my eyes. And I always go back to uh, James Martin, and I hope he's still here in the audience somewhere, and his seven samurai. And he talks about those early, uh, uh, those early definitions as being systems. So to me, they are a systems design. Um, and just trying to look at that sort of return on investment, uh, I guess. Um, and thanks to my colleague Michael Waite for pointing out this quote from Plato, just to indicate that even Greek philosophers knew about systems engineering. And in as much as they knew, the beginning is the most important part of that work. Um, and you, I've sort of just sort of slightly plagiarized this diagram at the bottom. I actually saw it in a presentation today where, where it talks about that system life cycle. And really up front is where we commit all our costs to that uh, engineering process. And, um, it's a diagram that's appeared in a number of references and including the, um, the Systems Engineering Handbook 3.2.1 or whatever it was in the early phases of our Systems Engineering Handbook a few years ago. But to me, that's the opportunity for the conceptual design to try and improve things in that end. And that's why we started this work many years ago, 10 years ago, started this work in model-based conceptual design to try and better enhance the design and the stakeholder needs and requirements in that early phase. Because to me, that's where we can have the biggest return on investment um, to push, get it right in that fairly early phase. So that when we, if there is a mistake, and we, <laughs> we try and remove those mistakes because when later in the life cycle they, they occur, it's going to cost a lot more to, to, to re uh, rectify those mistakes. So if we can get it right early on, I think that's the most one of the biggest return on investments we can, we can make. So um, I just wanted to talk through what we've actually done, I guess, from a model-based conceptual design in Australia. Um, we, in the Australian defence context, uh, very much focused on two documents, which is uh, the operational concept document and the functional performance specification document. And I will say document. Our process over there is still very document-based. Um, what we took, what took to this process was an underlying model-based approach to produce the documents. Um, and so uh, a, a team of us, um, including our industry partner, uh, Shoal Group, and also the acquisition community in defense, as well as some people in Defence Science and Technology Group. Um, and specifically from Shoal, and um, uh, I just want to make a quick reference to Paul, the late and great Paul Logan, who was very influential in this space, um, who's unfortunately no longer with us, but was very influential in bringing this together and sort of shaping how we put it together. But what we went through in this space to do was to produce the whole of CISL analytical framework, um, which was a descriptive model. We built a descriptive model of all the information required to engineer that front or design that front part of the um, life cycle so that we could get enough information and design to produce those documents. Um, and we're in that space, we were able to do that design analysis, design loop, and bring things together. And then, because we're in a design uh, document that centric process, we then exported that, that information into a document. And so just to sort of bring that in, I guess those a lot of words into a, into a hopefully one slide picture. Um, you've all seen those model based sort of systems engineering diagrams. We've got that a, across the top there. Um, but the important part for me was that human engagement in the bottom left hand, left hand side of that diagram. The thing that made it strong for me was that we would, as modelers, and it was our job to not to design the system, it was our job to elicit the, uh, the ideas and the content out of the experts, not for us to put. The, our own knowledge into the model, as it were. So we would sit there and workshop with the experts to bring this design together. And that's what that picture in the better bottom left-hand corner is trying to indicate. And we would then put all this into a model. And then, using a clever bit of scripting, we would then export that, all that information into a pre-formatted Word document that we would then pass on to the senior stakeholders to then review, peer review, look at, do whatever they want to. Um, so there was this sort of design loop going on through that as well. So that's the kind of approach we did. And, 
And you know, I've heard a lot of um, sort of talk this week about the you know the standard systems engineering process through there. We we did mission analysis, we did scenario analysis, we got the activity models going, we got understood the user needs, and so it was it was nothing more than a systems engineering process, except that we did it in a model-based way and used different methodologies to bring that together and then export it to a document. So the model-based systems engineering tool sort of facilitated that process. And, and through that, we got a, a lot of um, anecdotal sort of feedback, and this included from the sort of senior leaders and other experts who would review the documents, um, but also uh, independent peer review of, the, of documents as well. Okay, these are kind of anecdotal, but it, I guess to me, in, and they're not my comments, they're independent comments, and to me that sort of gives you the indication we're doing the right, the right thing. And so I guess my journey I wanted to start to go on was to understand why that was. And looking in the literature, it, it talks about that model-based systems engineering is a good way to manage the knowledge, uh, it's a good way to look at the knowledge, but to me that wasn't, that wasn't enough to say what we're actually doing better, to quote some of those uh, quotes, uh, in that space. And so I've sort of, through my own research, trying to explore that space and look at those softer skills and what are we actually doing through there and why does the model-based systems engineering approach help? And so I, I, I like to effectively go back to basics and have a look at this thing. And, and I guess this is one part of the start of the journey. There's a, there's a great paper from um, Randall Davis and his co uh, co-authors about the five reasons for knowledge representation. And to me, whether it's a model or a document, it's still knowledge representation. So I wanted to look at that, take that kind of framework into my thinking about why I had a better, better outcome from our model-based conceptual design approaches. And I really wanted to pick on the last two of his five reasons for, for that, which is, to use his words, a medium for efficient computation. So the reasoning and analysis we do with that modeling and then a medium for human expression, in other words, the communication that we have through that modeling. And I wanted to sort of pick on those and tell a few stories around that. And we've heard that stories are a really good way of projecting these across and just pick on those too. And when I started to dig into this a little bit more in terms of the research, what I was finding is those, that human endeavor in terms of engaging with the model, really trying to understand how we're using that model, um, brought me to these sort of three sort of summary points, I think, which is, there's sort of evidence out there in the literature that it talks about that it can sort of increase the creativity, it can improve the understanding. Um, and we heard, I think, from John Holt at the beginning of the week where he talked about mod how modelling would uh, help improve our understanding of the complexity of our systems. And I, that was one of the things that came through for me. And also then the ability to engage the experts. I think we, we were helped in that process. In the early phases of the life cycle, you get some very disparate um, stakeholders and users in this space from the logisticians, the trainers through to the mechanics or and even and also the users of the system, the actual war fighters for us. And so they're very disparate sort of um, experiences and backgrounds. So that was one other thing that I think the model-based approach brought, brought to us more than a document-centric approach. So creativity. This one's going to be a tough one. <laughs> Try and be creative about it. Um, so when I started doing the research in there, I thought, oh, who are the most two creative people I know? And what the research tells us is that when children reach about the age of nine or 10, their creativity starts to drop off and it only starts to increase as they enter into the workforce and things are done differently. So the education system sort of trains them out of it. And so the two most creative people I know are my son and my daughter. And you can see them here using their most creative tools that they have at hand, which are very much related to the model-based conceptual design space. My daughter is there, I was going to say bottom left, but I'm sure you can work out which is my daughter. <laughs> She's there bottom left playing in the Lego world and then and building the models in the Lego world. And my son, looking at the virtual world in the virtual Lego, he's up there with his Minecraft and he just loves producing sort of worlds and the like. And so, so I sort of took a look at what they were doing, what the research says. And to me, there's sort of two sort of areas that model-based approaches, more than document-based approaches, sort of bring to the table. And one is... One is that on the bottom right-hand corner, they actually immerse the designer in the thing they're designing. It's not just what was I thinking, put it on paper kind of thing. They're actually there moving the design around in that concept definition phase. And they get that instant feedback, like my son does with his Minecraft. He puts out you know, blocks, they move, they change shape. So it gives, them, it gives him that instant feedback on the function and the artistic content of that. But what it does, and this is, the, I guess, the analogy to the model-based approach, was it, it provides that structure 
but the freedom at the same time. So he's fr free to change the design within a structured sort of process and, and space. And to me, that's what the model-based conceptual design does. And that removing the mundane, as I put it there, top left, is sort of um, what I look at with, what I, as I've written a report in the, in the, in the past, you, I found myself getting wrapped around um, things like formatting, numbers of paragraphs, page numbering. And yes, templates can do that, but, but you, still get, you still get in there. And tracing information between paragraphs and diagrams is just, it's just a difficult thing to do. And it causes you to have that extra cognitive sort of load on you. So by putting it into that model world, it's, it's taken care for you. And it's, it's back to that sort of knowledge management side. It's done for you. So the combination of this and removing that mundane and immersing the designer in the, uh, the user, the expert in that model, is I, it, the literature tells us that that's how creativity comes, one of the things that drives creativity. So to me, that's one of the aspects for, to increase our creativity. Um, another sort of driver for creativity and, and new ideas is that diversity. And so what we found is that we would bring all these experts into a room to workshop the ideas and model the ideas. And by them coming and having a conversation, which they might not have done through a document-based approach or whatever, they started to share ideas. They started to look at things differently and different perspectives. And that different perspective and different ideas and, and their own creativity, their own motivation for different areas would start to stimulate ideas that would then be captured in the model and in, in the end improve, start to improve that design. So that diversity of ideas is realized in a, doc, in a model more than it can be in a document. So I've got another story about my son before I get into this one, and this is really about the curiosity. I was at home one day, and um, I was sitting there, and it was, I was playing some game with my son, and it, and it got a bit dark, and so I said to my son, I said, uh, let's, let's turn the lights on. And he looked at me, and he sort of said, why? And so I said, oh, it's getting dark. And he looked at me and said, why? I said, the sun's going down. And he looked at me and went, why? <laughs> And I said, well, because the earth rotates around the sun. <laughs> he looked at me and went, why? And at this moment, <laughs> I just lost my ability to talk about astrophysics. And also, I slightly lost my patience at that point. <laughs> but I guess the point I want to get to through that little story was, you really open up your mind by changing yourself to think about why. You take one point, and I did promise there was only going to be one eye test, but that eye test on the right is an example in the model-based conceptual design. You can see this triangulation formation. You took one piece of information and you traced it through the model by asking yourself, why, why? And this was, um, this was for those who have read the literature on Toyota, I guess, this was, um, I was going to find his name, because I'll have, have horrendous troubles getting this name right. I think it's Saki, Sakihita Toyota, I think his name is, from the Toyota company, um, who, who put this... Um, proposition out there that there's always got to be five whys to try and open your mind to thinking of alternatives and, and driving why things might be happening. And so this, to me, is another way of stimulating your creativity. If you can ask yourself why and really open up your thinking, then you've all of a sudden you've got this open playing field. And there's some recent work by um, Eric uh, von Hippel out of uh, MIT that's looked at this as well that sort of says, just ask yourself why and open that problem space. Open, therefore, the design space. So it gives you more options to be more creative. So understanding, I guess we, we, we heard from uh, John Holt at the beginning of the week the, the importance of uh, understanding our complex space. So I just wanted to get in, in, into that a little bit. Um, again, that curiosity is a driver for learning. I just went through this example of the whys. Um, by opening up that space, you're opening up and challenging yourself to your own thinking. And so... It gives you that ability to, to actually start to learn. Why is this doing this? What are, what are we doing here? And also, that curiosity then drives you to the what if kind of question as well, which is what we found with the modeling. We were there, and you know, the, the expert would ask us, oh, what if we did it this way? And it was a continuous sort of, um, I guess, design loop of going around with something was put down in a modeling based in an environment. They would ask the same question. And, this, this, this big diagram again on the right hand, right hand side led, led us to a number of what if questions and what if we did this way. So, and that, that learning about, you know, just, just, dare I use the word, playing with the model, experimenting with the model, just to find out the way things might look and feel and just can be described 
led to that better understanding in all our users and all our stakeholders, and they all had this sort of combined understanding. Um, and so, yeah, that what-if is a very strong thing to do, and if you can, you can do that in the modeling world, it, it brings you that increased learning and therefore understanding of our problem space. Um, and that was certainly evident in our sort of scenario analysis and then our mission analysis and vignettes, and what if we did the mission this way or mission that way? So it sort of came through. And then that leads me to another point. I've heard it a couple of times this week, which has been really pleasing um, in terms of increasing that learning and understanding. Um, on the left there, I've sort of got uh, a picture of our sort of top-level schema that we use during the model-based conceptual design approach. And what we found was it, would, it actually forces people to make explicit the implicit. So if you're in a document-based approach, and I heard this from Tim today. I can't remember your surname. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> when he talked about in the Dodaf speak or Modaf speak, the SV5, and how people would populate an SV5 view without actually knowing the relationship between functions and activities. Well, they would mentally know it, but they wouldn't document it. And so what we did in our schema was, was ensure that that structure was in place to make those mental leaps between those two pieces of information. And so there, it wasn't necessarily required for the documentation, but it was required for a rigorous structured engineering process to get through. And the benefit of that is when we went back to the model a year later and two years later, um, the information was there, the context, the understanding was there, and so we had this sort of loop that we could then use in that design loop. And why did we do this last time? And we had the context and understanding of why we did it last time. And so, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say this, but I will. I kind of, I kind of, it brought it home to me that we we're actually going through a learning process there and it was easier to pick up next time. But what we found was um, you couldn't cheat. <laughs> you actually had to mentally think about why you were making these decisions and that design rationale to take you through that design process. Um, and I heard it, uh, it was a plenary session this week, um, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, so I do apologise, hopefully he's gone home, uh, <laughs> um, where he talked about, for his junior engineers, what this actually enabled them to do, because they took a similar approach later in the life cycle, and it enabled them to actually learn about the engineering process and what was required. So not only did it help you learn about the system, but it also helped the engineers learn, which was an interesting insight that I saw, saw this week. Um, so, yeah, making explicit that implicit because you're, you're, you're focused to do it through that structured approach. And therefore, you have this sort of better implementation of the design loop. And also, you can go back to it and, the, and look at those decisions and those design rationale um, what you made. How long have we got, Ian? 15 minutes. I'll, I'll make these. I've got two more stories. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, my last two stories. Um, it's about engaging the experts. Um, and I'll go back to the, the picture of my father there. Um, as I said, through his career, he went to, um, he got into doing this sort of concept formulation. And um, one of the things I've, I've noticed about that through my own career and understanding what we achieved in a model-based conceptual design approach rather than you know, the document-centric approach was that ability to communicate and connect and coordinate with, with the stakeholders. And, against, and again, as, as I said, up front and early, you've got this really diverse range of stakeholders. So um, what we tried to do in the model-based conceptual design space was try to talk their language. Um, and that included the diagrams and the way we engaged them. But, and I guess this is, this is evident from, from my father here. I remember him, particularly with this model, you know, he built this model off some sketches from a, blue, from a blueprint kind of thing, because that's what he did back then. Um, and I remember we could get him frustrated for two reasons. One, one is, as he showed, um, showed the original sort of stakeholders what he'd produced off those diagrams, the stakeholders had actually seen those original blueprints, but because they're not architectural mechanics or whatever the blueprints are drawn in, um, whatever sort of language they're drawn in, because they weren't that. They didn't really understand them, and they couldn't see every sort of kind of detail in those diagrams. So when he'd show them this 3D representation, he'd get very annoyed with them when they'd say, oh, no, we don't want that there. We want that there. I mean, this should be like that, and that should be like this. And he'd get very frustrated with them and say, well, that's what you put in the diagram. <laughs> and there would be this little to and fro in until he really sort of started to understand what they actually wanted. And so using that 3D representation in that case, so you could see where you know, the, mechanic would, would do its, the mechanic would do his activity and the analyst would do its acti his activity or her activity. So it sort of frustrated him a little bit, but, but it got 
to a better solution in the end, and that sort of refinement through the design in a language they could talk to and work with was very strong. And that's what we found in the model-based conceptual design space. We, kept, we tried to keep the modeling language and the way we engage with the stakeholders very simple. They don't have time to learn our engineering language, so we tried to talk to, them in, talk to them in their language and model in their language, and then we'd do the translation and get it in the model. And then the other thing was that frustrated him was was that connecting and coordinating of, of stakeholders. So, you know, a number of times he'd just talk to one stakeholder and they'd change things around. And, but it wasn't until he took his model to all the stakeholders and they said, well, actually, if we do this or that, and it add, they'd add things. And again, it was the same process. Well, we can't do that like this. And they, so bringing them together enabled them to, to talk through something that they can share together and uh, connect around and coordinate around was really powerful and it evolved the design. And that's the same what we found with the model-based conceptual design space. You can actually get everyone talking together and actually have that co communication, that con conversation to understand why are they thinking about things this way and why, you know, those shared views. So that's a sort of very um, sort of strong sort of um, aspect for me in the model-based conceptual design space rather than a document-based approach. And then I guess the last one, I'm trying to do a bit of a run through on the family history, but there, there's me. So uh, another thing from some of the work out of uh, Eric von Hippel is he, he looks at the leveraging the users in the design space. And there's lots of examples out there in the commercial world where users and their passion for, for design and wanting to solve problems has actually produced um, some, some quite significant things. And, and this, is, this is my little example of that. Um, I, I and my family have a passion for, for camping, and we go out thanks Ian, uh, go out into remote places where we have to take all our water and power. Um, when you're out in these hot places, I have a passion for cold beer. <laughs> cold beer requires more power because you have a fridge. So we have our camping fridge, and one way to bring that power to the camping fridge is you take a small battery, but you take two large solar panels, as you can see on the on the left-hand side, and that's very common in Australia. Go out there, you go to any sort of remote campsite, and everyone's got their solar panels out. Some must be something to do with Australians and cold beer. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> There's always a solar panel out. Um, and I, I bought all this equipment, and I, I brought it up, and I went to my first camp with the with the family, and, and I, I got very frustrated even the first time. But by the third time of dragging all these wires out, as you can see connecting the solar panel to the regulator, the regulator to the battery, the battery to the fridge, the lights, and because I've got young children, iPads in the middle of nowhere needed charging, so I had to have the whole suite of electronics there. I got very frustrated with having to roll all these cables out, and then when we come to pack up, you've got screaming kids that want to go very quickly, so I'd have to pack it all up. I said, no, I've, I really need to solve this problem. And so I just... And I've said here, leverage their expertise. I haven't got a large expertise in electronics, but I can do sort of how happy to do with 12 volts. So I, I bought my regulator, I bought a box, I put it all in, into this one box. So all the sort of spaghetti is now in that box. And so what I do on the day is I, I rock up, plug the solar panels in one side, plug the lights in the other, and the fridge in one side, and the battery goes on. And it, it's just a nice dare I say it myself, an elegant solution, an innovative solution. And a number of people have commented on that. So it's sort of that passion that I had drove me to want to solve my own problem. And that's the same for model-based conceptual design. When we, when we got the stakeholders in there and all these experts in there, they, they start to want to solve their own problem. It's part of their future. They want to actually solve that problem. That's a real strong leverage that you can use. And... <clears throat> They, they get this sort of passion and motivation about solving it. But also, the other sort of soft thing you do is, is do they actually own the design then more than they do a document? So they actually take that passion into the ownership of the design. They feel part of that design and more willing to push it through the process. So it's quite a sort of strong thing to uh, leverage in, in this particular case in terms of all these users. <clears throat> so that was my last story. So I'm just going to finish off given Ian's cards, probably five minutes early, so that's not a bad thing. Um, so I guess what I'm, my journey I'm starting to in this research space and trying to understand those softer sides, I, I think there is evidence out there in the literature that taking these model-based approaches does increase our creativity in, 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 the, in, I guess, and it's equally applicable, I would imagine, later in the life cycle. I'm just sort of talking about this early phase in conceptual design. 
And so that, I think there is an opportunity there to increase their creativity through that sort of freeing the mind, immersing those users and experts and bringing those experts and ideas through. Um, there is that opportunity, and this is true for, I guess, for the rest of life cycle in understanding that complexity. There was, you know, real sort of clarity in some of the concepts and conversations that were happening around model-based conceptual design. And then that engaging of the expertise and actually levering that user expertise and, and <clears throat> into this space and getting them to own and shape the design to what they want was really sort of quite a powerful. So sort of based on the literature and my thinking and what we observed, and it's just, as I say, the start of this journey that I want to I take. So I just sort of go back to that, that sort of quote I, I started with about that uncertainty as a sure thing. I guess to me there is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity in this space. But if we address it right, we have that opportunity to, to actually leverage that. And I think it's a good thing. I think, you know, as a show, that, that complexity drives the need to bring diversity into the problem space. And so, you know, it increases the creativity and the ideas that come through. So I think we shouldn't think of it as a, as a bad thing, that complexity. We just have to deal with it. And I think it brings strengths to what we're trying to achieve. Um, <clears throat> and so, really, I guess, I guess that's all I've got to say. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Um, and I don't want to steal, steal Jackie's thunder, but I hope to see you all uh, in Adelaide next year. Um, and I'd, I guess, like to open the floor to some questions that maybe won't, won't be my, as effective as that one, maybe. <laughs> questions. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Right. Don't go away at the end. No, no. Yeah.